Good morning, everyone. I welcome you all another, on another session of India Ireland Friendship Lecture Series. And today we have with us Mr. Nitin Malhotra, who is president of Alumni Association of Indian Institute of Technology, Banaras Sindhu University. Mr. Malhotra did his BTech honors from IIT BHU and MS Engineering from University of Washington. He has done research on fiber optic waveguides on a Bell Lab funded project at the University of Washington. And there he also taught material science to all engineering students. Mr. Malhotra established four industries manufacturing ultramarine blue, sodium silicate, ceramic tiles and sanitary wares, and also started residential and commercial project. Currently he is establishing a 40 megawatt solar plant in Prayagraj and an 8 megawatt solar plant in Gujarat. He is also involved with various projects such as Clean Asi River, which connects to River Gan Ganga, and also closely connected with Tata Memorial Cancer Hospital and helped them establish the Mahamana Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya Cancer Center at Varanasi. He is also associated with Ramkish Mission Hospital in Varanasi for the last four decades. He has been nominated by the state government as a member to the Board of Governors of the prestigious Indian Institute of Technology, where he provides his expertise on various matters. Today, Mr. Malhotra will share his views on the topic from ancient Vedic times to IITs, India's long-standing tradition of learning. Before we invite Mr. Malhotra for the talk, I would request His Excellency, the Ambassador of India, Sri Aklesh Mishra, to kindly give his introductory remarks to the talk. Sir, please. Sir, my very warm greetings to you, uh, Malhotra ji from Dublin, Ireland. I also extend very warm welcome to all friends in India and Ireland who are joining this program. Uh, for me personally, it's a very special uh, uh, privilege to welcome uh, Nitin ji because uh, he's my senior uh, and uh, I, like him, I'm also a student of uh, IIT BHU. So uh, he has been a very inspiring role model for me uh, and uh, particularly his uh, work in uh, uh, IIT Alumni Association is truly uh, an example uh, of giving back to the society. And the way, uh, Netinji, you are uh, energizing the network of IIT, BHU alumni, uh, making uh, them uh, work together, share ideas, share information, and uh, uh, work together for betterment of India, uh, and your personal leadership in providing mentorship to the next generation is uh, truly inspiring. And I do hope sometime to follow your example and join your team. Uh, and also I'm very grateful for you, for your acceptance of our invitation to deliver a lecture on this particular theme, because uh, this theme is uh, extremely important uh, for all of us. Uh, particularly in the context of uh, the new education policy, which our new Prime Minister's uh, vision uh, had it announced. Uh, and also his uh, vision of Panchaprana. Uh, in a few days, we'll be uh, complete. We'll be making, uh, uh, celebrating Independence Day, which marks uh, the culmination of Ajadi Kamrut Mahotsav. Uh, and we are entering that vision of uh, uh, Amrit Kal, preparing India, which is developed, which is uh, free from colonial mindset and also proud of uh, its heritage. So your theme, your topic is extremely important uh, uh, for all of us. Thank uh, you, thanks very much. Uh, and, and also uh, uh, the ancient Indian tradition uh, uh, stands out uh, in, in its primacy attached to knowledge. Uh, the most, uh, the fountain head of Indian, Indian philosophy okay. Organization, Vedas, Veda literally means to know. Correct. Uh, and also, uh, really, the Vedic tradition uh, also stands out uh, in being not driven by faith, not driven by uh, just dictate of uh, the guru or the teacher, but is inherently experiential. Uh, Richo Akshare Parame Yoman Jasmin Deva Adivishwe Nishedu Yastan Kim Vichakarishyati. So just learning of even 
Vedas and Vedic mantras is not enough unless you realize it. And that's why Rishis were not called writers of mantras, they were seers of mantras. Uh, and also, uh, uh, as a scientist, as an engineer, I myself marvel at the genius of our thought leaders, Asian thought leaders, that they visualize the importance of knowledge uh, in, in a very unique manner. Uh, like in the Western so called scientific approach is very egoistic. Uh, it, it relies on your like, one's own senses and how do they measure, how do they replicate, how do they perceive. Whereas the Indian sages uh, upfront cautioned us about the limitation of our senses and adopting that egoistic, arrogant approach to quest of knowledge, right. and the nature. Uh, one basic fundamental limitation of our senses is they are all of all of them are extrovert. Uh, they can only see what lies outside. So they only see part of the reality. Uh, uh, and if, as per the advice of the sages, we close our eyes and turn our senses inwards, uh, uh, with the chakshusha, then we see the fuller world. And that also has uh, the, the effect of making our knowledge integrated, holistic. And this is one very big crisis that we are facing uh, because of the segmentation of knowledge in the West. Uh, the, the modern knowledge has been very narrowly segmented, no. compartmentalized. And if, if we focus on one issue, then we lose sight of the other. Uh, healthcare is a very prime example. Uh, the allopathic treatment focuses on the symptoms and tries to rectify one okay. particular disease, one particular symptom. And okay. then realize that in the same process, there are a lot of side effects and negative implications are being created. So you cannot deal with anything in isolation. Okay. Uh, that is why, uh, as per this Latin tradition, the entire existence is seen as a one single complex inherently complex system of growth to knowing. Uh, so uh, what uh, you are trying to revive through your uh, inspiring leadership uh, and also Arnold Pramis of Modi's vision of India, which is connected with its roots, its own knowledge traditions, and making full advantage of what we already have, the treasure we have, not only for our own well-being, but also larger well-being of the world, right? the spirit of Vasudhaya Kutumbakam. So I'm really grateful, uh, Nidhiji, for your acceptance of our invitation to share your thoughts. It's a pleasure and for me. It's a great opportunity for me. It will be a source of inspiration for not only me, but also a uh, very large and growing, vibrant Indian community here. And also it will inspire our Irish friends. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your lavish praise. I'm not so sure if I deserve so much praise, but anyway, thank you so much. Can I, Devaji, can I start? Or can I start? Yes, please. So, um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, our talented ambassador, His Excellency Akhilesh Mishra, Ms. Hema Sharma, that I can see. Um, a very good morning to all of you. Um, before I start, uh, I want to offer my deep gratitude to the gracious people of Ireland for uh, lending their support throughout our freedom movement. I must also thank them during the tragic, their help during the tragic accident of uh, the plane crash of Air India where 329 passengers and crew died for no rhyme or reason just because one mad terrorist had put a bomb in the Air India plane in Canada. So to the good people of Ireland, thank you very much for your unwavering support. Um, uh, Ambassador Akhilesh Mishra has given me this opportunity to say a few words. I take this as a big privilege. And uh, we, our alma mater is the same. So I think uh, the praise he's given me, I, I'm not so sure if I deserve so much, but anyway, thank you very much. So let me uh, begin with the topic of today. And it is that 
India's long-standing tradition of learning from Vedic times to the modern Indian Institutes of Technology, which are generally known as IITs in India and abroad. So a long-standing tradition of uh, India that has shaped its intellectual landscape is a tradition of learning from ancient times to the modern IITs, as I said. India, with its rich cultural heritage, has always been a hub of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, from the ancient Vedic era to the modern days, our thirst for knowledge has been deeply ingrained in our psyche, and that has really helped us move from millennia to millennia with a continued civilization uh, that no other country has a continued civilization for 5,000 years. Our most important scriptures, the Ramayana, which is more than 5,000 years old, uh, describes the Gurukul. Gurukul is basically a residential school where a guru would impart a holistic education to young boys. So during this period when Lord Rama is sent, when he attains the age of 15 years, he is sent to the Gurukul of Guru Vishwamitra. Obviously, his parents are very sad to let their son go out of sight. And I'm familiar with this thing. Even after 5,000 years, this tradition continues. I see grieving parents and very sad parents when they come to leave their child in the sprawling IIT campus. It's another story that after six months, this young kid doesn't want to go back home. He's so much in love with IIT that he doesn't want to go back home to the shock of his parents. So. Um, in Gurukul, everything was being taught from grammar to languages to literature to philosophy to statecraft and use of arms. So it made uh, every student um, a whole, whole being. And uh, so Gurukuls were not restricted to the royalty. Commoners and kings alike would attend the Gurukul. And once they left the Gurukul, they would go back to contribute to their society as civilized young, young people. Similarly, in Mahabharata, which probably came about 800 years after Ramayana, the Pandava and Kaurav princes were sent to the Gurukul of Guru Dronacharya. So the same uh, statecraft, astronomy, economics, all these things were being taught. To the surprise of everybody, a young commoner, uh, a common citizen, a young boy called Eklavya, he excelled in the school, uh, much to the surprise of all royalty. And uh, so he stood first in the class. Like uh, Atlesh, he would say that I'm from the class of 2000 or maybe 1999, I don't remember. So Eklavya was from the class of maybe 5023 BCE. So you can imagine that we have, we have a long, long tradition of going to school. In the similar quest of knowledge, which has been pertaining all our thousands of years, Lord Buddha, he renounced his kingdom, left his family, left his young wife and child, went to the jungles to meditate, to question the purpose of life, the meaning of death, etc. So, and it is from there that uh, Buddhism started. So, Buddhism basically started uh, from the thirst of knowledge of Lord Buddha. So, I'm, I'm just trying to re emphasize that this thirst of knowledge has been um, there for all times uh, in our Indian psyche. By around 1200 BCE, that's 1200 years um, before Common Era, before Christ, formal universities were being established in India. Nalanda and uh, Takshila were flourishing. The number of enrolled students was more than 20,000. The library had 10 million books. We had people, we had students from Tibet, China, neighboring countries. Every subject possible was being taught from medicine, anatomy, foreign policy, philosophy, astronomy, uh, languages. Uh, it was here that the intellectual giant Chanakya was uh, teaching 
statecraft, foreign policy, philosophy, economics. So when the students got out from these universities, they went back to their kingdom, to their societies, made sure that these societies prospered and the kings became more powerful. And Chanakya uh, advised a very minor king at that point in time called Chankup Maurya to carve out the biggest empire in India. And this was around 300 BC. So knowledge, learning, all these things have been going hand in hand in India. So with this tradition of learning, it's no wonder that India invented the concept of zero. And without zero, I think uh, nothing would have been possible. Maybe we, we would have all been zeros by this time. You'd probably be jumping on the trees for all you know. Um, so when the students uh, um, got out of Gurukul, they had a certain uh, duty. But before that, uh, I want to tell you that uh, during this time in the ancient times, um, Aryabhata, our astronomer, about 2000 years old, was able to very accurately, fairly accurately calculate the distance from the sun to earth. Uh, Maharishi Shushrut was the father of Indian medicine, like uh, our ambassador was telling. And he was also the father of surgery. At that point in time, this is 800 BC, he was conducting cataract surgeries, plastic surgeries, normal surgeries. So India was a fairly evolved society then. Uh, as I was telling you about Mahabharata also, uh, when Lord Krishna gave his sermon in Bhagavad Gita, not only the princes, but the entire, the masses also understood the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita, which meant that by and large, the masses were or had a, uh, had some kind of an education to understand this deep philosophy. So all this learning process has been going on for a long, long time in India. So when students got out of Gurukul, they came to the second phase of life. The first phase of life was of a student, a celibate. The second life, the second phase of life pushed you into becoming a householder, starting a family, earning a livelihood, being able to contribute to the society, and in turn, uh, telling you that when your children grow up, make sure that they get a good education in, in a Gurukul. And this tradition is very strong. For all Indian parents, educating their child is the most paramount duty of uh, parents in India. The third phase of life was <clears throat> when, the third phase of life would basically mean my age group of people, my admini friends who were supposed to pay back to the society. So the third phase of life was to pay back to the society. The fourth phase was to was to renounce everything, renounce everything, go to the jungle, think about life, prepare for death. And in our Indian system, death was not an end all. It was the beginning of another life. So death was nothing to be really feared of. So this four phases of life has been ingrained in our psyche for a long, long time, except maybe for those thousand years of foreign rule, which is extremely brutal and it messed up most of our traditions and education system. This phase of life, uh, four phases of life are deeply ingrained in our uh, mind, regardless of whether you're an ITN or you're a 10th class diploma, everybody believes in that. So uh, during this, Thousand years of foreign rule, one small time, Turkish Muslim general called Bhaktiar Hilji invaded Nalanda. He simply could not comprehend the purpose of having 9 million books. So he burnt everything. And I'm told the history tells us that this fire raged for three to four months. So basically, 1000 years of foreign rule messed up our education system also our psyche. I think now there is a resurgence of our old traditions and I'm very happy about it that it's taken us so long to get back to our old systems. So in a way, I must thank our Irish friends for throwing out your neighbor in 1947 from India. So thank you once again, our Irish friends. You helped us a lot. Thank you. Uh, coming back to the main topic today, the IITs, the Indian Institutes of Technology. 
The IITs were opened in the 50s and 60s, 1950s and 60s. But even before that, engineering colleges of considerable repute were functioning in India. In 1916, the legendary Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya opened Banaras Hindu University from charity. Uh, obviously, the Britishers were not going to help him build a university. So he did all this by himself. And every subject and under the sun was being taught there. So we had a college of medicine with a big hospital attached, modern medicine, and also Ayurvedic medicine. There was a college of law. There was a college of uh, music, arts, pure sciences, economics, business management. Three years down the line, he felt then that India must have uh, an engineering college. And that's how Banaras uh, Engineering College was started in 1919. This is the uh, Banaras Engineering College is the genesis of IIT BHU. So in the beginning, three subjects were taught. I'm talking of 1920 now, uh, civil engineering, electrical and mechanical. And subsequently down the line, chemical, mining, metallurgy, ceramics, et cetera, were added in the late 70s and 80s computer science, electronics, biomedical, uh, pharmacy, et cetera, were added. So in all, the campus um, could offer everything that a young student wanted to learn. Uh, the IIT story in some ways is similar to India's growth story. Um, it might even complement the India's growth story. Uh, IIT brand today is well-known and respected all over the world especially in Bay Area, in America, uh, in all US universities. And uh, with an IIT degree, you are the first among equals to get VC funding in Bay Area, which is, is very strange and a very happy incident for me. Um, the impact of uh, IIT alumni in the tech industry in America has been more than profound. Almost all the top tech companies have CEOs who are IITians. So this 50 years uh, or 60 years of uh, IIT has been an amazing story if people think about it. Um, IITians have done very well in the Indian landscape also. The current fashion among young students getting out of IIT is obviously to join the financial sector. So they want to do an MBA, join a hedge fund, or investment banking, or you know, trade on the stock uh, market floor. Um, obviously, because there is more money in it, so we cannot blame them. So, in spite of learning all the hardcore engineering to go into finance, and so we have a lot of financial geniuses today, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And those who don't don't think much of an MBA, and a lot of uh, students who think MBA is hardly a degree joined software companies and do very well there. Uh, they're very outstanding software uh, people. Uh, around the 70s and 80s, the IIT brand had become so well entrenched across Europe, Europe and obviously India, that uh, just say that you're from an IIT and it opened a lot of doors for you. Uh, slowly and steadily in US, our early pioneers who went in the 70s and 80s started moving up the ladder step by step. Um, unlike ITN's heading organizations in India at that point in time, which started to head organizations in India, Indian ITNs in US were not heading organizations. So in hushed tones, they would talk that maybe we'll reach the number two or number three position in this top tech company, but never, but never number one. So one reason was the lack of self-confidence, which uh, obviously a thousand years of uh, colonial rule or robs you of your self-confidence. Self but look at the way things have changed now. Every tech company in America is headed by an ITN, as I told you. So it is um, Sundar Pichai of Google, Jay Chaudhary of Zscaler, Ajay Pal Singh Banga is uh, the CEO of World Bank. Vikram Pandit is CEO of City Group. Arvind Krishna is CEO of IBM. Shantanu Narana is CEO of Adobe and likewise many others. But I must also mention Ajit Jain. Uh, Ajit Jain uh, uh, 
has steered Warren Buffett's company for the last 25, 30 years, I think. And Warren Buffett thinks that he is a gift of God. Ajit Jain is a gift of God. And uh, so Berkshire Hathaway, if it does very well, it's also because of Ajit Jain, who is from IIT, Kharagpur, I think. So now there are almost 2,000 IITians working in the Bay Area alone. And all of them have good jobs. And uh, it's a very proud moment for all IITs here. And I, I'd like to narrate a funny incident which happened some 25 years back. You know, we have, uh, besides techies uh, heading, we also have uh, big names in uh, in VC funding. So the big time VCs in Bay Area are uh, Kamal Rekhi, Vinod Khosla. Some 25 years back, Vinod Khosla was invited by the Chief Minister of Delhi in a seminar. And uh, I guess she started on a little wrong footing and she said, uh, Government of India spends so much money on training these young kids in IITs and they go away to greener pastures. Um, so this is a serious case of brain drain. Brain drain was a very um, common phrase in those days and all of us were getting sick of this phrase. And suddenly Vinod Khosla walked out and he said, what would you rather have, brain in the drain or brain drain? And uh, so this was very upsetting to some of our politicians, but I think brain drain has also helped India a lot. And um, likewise, uh, Narayan Murthy, the founder of uh, Infosys, was asked uh, by Dan Walters in the popular uh, US show called 60 Minutes. So it, it had a huge viewership. And so he asked uh, Narayan Murthy, mm, he's a big, big, um, uh, CEO of Infosys. What happens, sir, if your son doesn't qualify for the tough entrance exam of IIT? So, um, Narayan Murthy, Mr. Narayan Murthy, without batting an eyelid and in a very candid matter, said, "Well, he'll have to join Cornell." So, so now, so now you can visualize where IIT stand before top American universities. And uh, just to let you know that. Uh, Mr. Narayan Murthy's daughter uh, is the first lady of your dear neighbor UK. So, so um, IIT students have played a lot of big part in India's development story. Um, there are our students in financial sector. We have some governors of central banks, which is very surprising. They've joined politics, they have joined NGOs. A um, lot of IITians have cleared the tough civil service exam, um, uh, which is a very tough exam, which makes uh, uh, bureaucrats, senior bureaucrats and policymakers. And one of them is our uh, talented uh, ambassador, Akhilesh Mishra. It's a very tough exam to qualify. and. Uh, so our ambassadors do a great job furthering our friendship with various countries and furthering our economic interests and mutual, mutually beneficial economic interests. Um, as I said, we have a lot of politicians. Manoj Parikar was the chief minister of Goa and later on went on to become the defense minister and he changed a lot of things in the defense industry. Um, I should say a few words about Dr. Kota Harinarayan. Um, he uh, has been in the defense industry for the longest time, and he is the visionary behind our Tejas jet fighter aircraft, which we now export to 30, 35 countries. Uh, so I remember a quote from him when somebody, he was saying that when the Americans came and they said, why do you want to make your fighter aircraft? Because we'll give you a F-16. Similarly, the French came and they said, why would we'll give you a Rafael, whatever. And, so everybody told him, why reinvent the wheel? And he said, no, no, the wheel has to be constantly reinvented. We have, so they have been able to really slash the prices. Our jet fighter probably cost one tenth of the other jet fighters. And so Dr. Kota Harinarayan is again from IIT BHU. Um, the governor of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, Manoj Sinha, is from IIT BHU. We have a very young Irina Ghosh, uh, who is heading Microsoft. So all these people have done wonders. And uh, not to miss out on some people, some ITNs who have become monks. 
uh, some have joined Hare Krishna movement, and uh, I'm very impressed with them. Um, some have become joint NGOs. Uh, they realize early that uh, taking up a job and uh, being um, rich was not the way to go ahead in life. So they look after very poor kids, and I think they're doing a great work for the society. I would like to mention here uh, Narayan Murthy again and his partner Nandan Nilikeni, both are from IIT Bombay. Um, Infosys was started from scratch. Today, its market cap is a whopping $700 billion. So when Infosys started from scratch and gradually grew big, a lot of software companies in Bangalore and near about areas also started. So Infosys was like a catalyst. And because of Infosys, so many software companies came up that India was suddenly being recognized as a good software exporter. But beyond that, Nandan Nilkani must be credited in many ways of the GDP growth of India uh, that we see today. Uh, he helped the government um, get uh, every Indian under a unique ID number. It was called Aadhaar Card India. And for taxation purposes, a PAN card. So suddenly, every Indian had a unique identity number. And now, to open a bank account, it was mandatory that you present yourself with these cards. So the first thing that happened was that all fictitious bank accounts, which were channeling ill-gotten wealth, were shut down. The next step was to uh, create a massive software for GST. In the meanwhile, because poor people had bank accounts now, the government was able to pay and give them any help monetarily directly in their account without uh, any leakages. So once the GST was rolled out, which I think is the biggest economic mechanism in the last 70 years, because now the tax administration was in the know of every citizen, the GST alone, and I'm not talking of direct taxes, the GST alone gives uh, the government city a $21 billion every month. Now, with $21 billion coming month after month, I think Nandan Nilkani is truly the boss. Um, so with $21 billion, now we have new railway lines, new, roadway, uh, new roads, new airports. Government has been able to provide 20 million houses to the poor free of cost. Um, we have new grid lines, electric grid lines. We have internet facilities. So telecom, digital. So India is, uh, because of the GST, India has turned into a dreamland of infrastructure. Um, during the COVID times, um, there were terrible times, as a lot of Indians would remember. Every Indian was uh, given a free injection, and three shots were given free of cost. And the humongous data that had to be collected, collated for this exercise was done by the health ministry, which was, and this operation was also being headed by an ITN in Uttarash. So now every Indian had uh, a vaccination certificate on his or mobile uh, phone. So when I think about it, I think, what if there are 50 Nandan Nilkenis? Uh, India would very easily become probably among the top two economies of the world. So, so there's a lot, lot of things that can be done and I'm sure things will happen more fast now. Um, I would like to say a few words of the alumni association, which uh, Akhilesh told about me. So all IIT alumni associations, most of them are concerned with improving their own IITs, building their own alumni network. But none of the associations have really thought about collectively getting together and doing something for the country as a whole. Uh, sometime back, a pan IIT association was started, but even then, even that is not thinking, that has not started thinking on developing something for the country. Um, all IIT alumni associations hold those IITs who made it rich in America in the highest esteem. Sadly, this should not be the way to go. We have a lot of young and very talented professors uh, in our uh, in universities all around the world. We have a lot of very talented young ITNs working very hard in core engineering labs. I see them in Livermore, 
Lawrence Livermore Lab and Pacific Northwest Lab. I think they should be given as much weightage as anybody else. Um, one very good news for IIT is, is that a lot of young students don't want to take up jobs now. They want to do their own startups. So in this context, uh, if you go to Bangalore and you invite these young kids, 30% of them are girls. And I'm so impressed that uh, when I look at these young kids, I know that the future of India is very, very bright. They want to create startups. Um, as some of these startups become unicorns, they are going to really fuel India's growth story. And uh, I'm very excited about the startup culture shaping up. Another good news for IITs is that IITs are going to start opening campuses in more countries. So the first IIT that is being has started uh, is going is being opened is in Zanzibar. The director is a uh, Miss Preeti, Doctor Miss Preeti Alegyan. Preeti as in Preeti Patel, your home secretary in UK. So I think once more campuses are opened. Uh, because of the camaraderie between IIT students, countries will get closer, there will be international brother, brotherhood. So, so this is a great, great idea. Um, the next step is to focus on our country's future generations. There's been a lot of innovation for industry economic growth in the past few decades, driven in part by IIT brains around the globe, but with more or less disregard for sustainable growth. Now we are at a point we need all the possible solutions to fix climate change, associated problems, warming, climate varying, extreme climate events, droughts, wildfires, degradation of environment. So this is going to be a huge problem for our future, future generations and IIT kids really need to work on this. So this is a long list and uh, it disproportionately affects countries like India. So we desperately need IIT LMs and future graduates to innovate in this space and tackle the issue from different angles. Not just technologies to reduce greenhouse gases, but also technologies to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, from direct air capture based um, greenhouse gas removal technologies to smart agriculture for increasing soil carbon and other nature-based climate uh, climate solutions. It's all hands on deck. And I urge IITNs to apply the talents, not just for business, that they should make profits, obviously, but to look at the bigger picture of the planet and think about what kind of inherit inheritance they want to leave for future generations. The major problems facing uh, the world, like sustainability, environment, and degradation, AI misuse, overpopulation, these problems are fairly well known now. So once the problems are clearly known, I'm sure solutions are bound to be found. Already in this context, a lot of changes are happening in the course materials for IIT students. Um, I'm also happy to tell you that um, the top renewable energy companies are now headed by ITNs. Uh, I see many young graduates working very hard in this field. Um, so this gives me hope that future generations will stand up to the challenges facing our planet. And uh, ITNs will do a good job. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I hope I did not sound too biased towards IITs. Because the fact is that there are many, many institutions in India doing excellent work, like the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, Indian Space Research Organization, Bhav Atomic Research Center, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Indian Institutes of Management are, are doing a great job, and many, many more. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Ambassador Akhilesh Sharma and Ms. Uh, Akhilesh Mishraji and Ms. Hemant Sharma, thank you very much. Uh, for a lot of people who might not know that uh, the Indian flag and Irish flag are very similar. The Irish flag is 90 degrees turned around. So our flags uh, bind us together. Uh, our history 
binds us together. And I'm sure in future, our tech hubs in Dublin and Bangalore will further bind us. Uh, so thank you once again for listening to me patiently and uh, I wish you all a very good day ahead and thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You have a very good and inspiring message here. Talking about India Island Connect, uh, I can share with you that even in the establishment of Manas Hindu University, there is an Irish link. Uh, Indy Besant, she was a, a friend of Mohan right. uh, Malvi ji and right. the first constant college of Banaras University was right. a college set up by Indy Besant. Correct, correct. This is one the Correct, correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. We have a lot of profound connectivities between India and Ireland. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Area of yes. your personal interests like the startup and innovation and mentoring of the next generation. I can share that uh, again. There's a lot of opportunity for us to work together with Ireland Correct. because Correct. Ireland, with a population of just five million population people, has uh, twenty-five to thirty thousand startups. Correct. Uh, and also, the startup success rate in Ireland is highest in Europe. Correct. With a twelve percent income tax, you have attracted the best companies in the world. Yeah. So, no, in terms of innovation in the startup. So in, in, in Ireland, the startup uh, success rate is 16 to 17 percent, where the European Union average is only 6 to 7 percent. Correct. So, so uh, Correct. I would be very happy if you can uh, share your thoughts in due course uh, about how do we work together and startup ecosystems of India and Ireland, how do we benefit from each other's experience and complementarities. Okay, so um, give me some time. Uh, we are doing a startup event in October in Bangalore. You know, Bangalore has somehow become the capital of startups now. Yes. And so we, IDBHU is doing a big startup event there. Let me uh, thrash around some thoughts with uh, people in this line. And uh, I'll probably send you a one page note of uh, how Bangalore companies can. Uh, and obviously, everybody would be attracted to. Ireland, uh, the landscape there is very, very beautiful. So everybody would like to come. Thank you so much. Very grateful for your, uh, your very thoughtful and very inspiring uh, lecture. I'm very honored, very honored. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.